Hello again. Right, this time we are going to take a real quick storm through uh, Kebble's GPU primitives, but with the assumption that you already know OpenGL, and so you're just looking to map existing knowledge over to Kebble. We've uh, got a few things that are going to need some dummy data, so that's what we've just defined here on the right. So the data variable now contains this array. Okay, so a natural first place to start would be buffer objects. Uh, while Kebble does have uh, types that abstract, buffer objects, most of the time we don't interact with those directly. And the reason is that most of the time our data has some kind of layout and it has a length, at which point we're essentially dealing with an array. Um, so what Kepler has is a function called make GPU array. Um, as you can see in the signature down the bottom here, uh, you can provide initial contents, which is what we're going to do with data. Um, but you can also provide access style dimensions and element type uh, if you want to do that. The element type uh, doesn't just have to be simple primitive types, it can also be structs that you can define in Kepple. Kepple has a macro called def struct g, and it allows you to define a structure that works on the CPU and GPU side. But let's just make this array. So here you can see the result. What's happened is that uh, Kepple has gone and looked at the elements of the array um, to find out what a sensible type would be because we didn't provide that. Um, it has then created a GPU buffer and uploaded the data to that buffer. Now, of course, a lot of the time you're going to want to allocate a number of GPU arrays inside the same buffer. Uh, for that, we have the make GPU arrays function. What you can do is you can give a list of data sources and you'll get back a list of GPU arrays with everything allocated inside the same new buffer object. We're not going to deal with that this second, so we'll just delete that. Define a new variable for our GPU array, and now we have this. Um, other things you can do with GPU arrays is take a subsection of them. Um, so let's just take a small section of that array. You can now pull and push data um, to this GPU array, just to that subsection of it. Um, this hasn't created a new GPU buffer, so you're just looking at a window inside the existing data. So of course you've got to be careful with freeing this stuff, but you know, that's standard behavior. All right, there's plenty more information on um, GPU arrays available, so we're going to move swiftly on. Another thing we can touch on very quickly are UBOs. So to make a UBO, as you'd expect, there's a make UBO function. Uh, the UBO function can take some data and optionally an element type. Um, normally, normally in Keppel, we'd make a stroke that describes the layout of our UBO. Um, but for now, we're going to do something completely pointless and just stick a float in there. And you can see we get our UBO object. Let's make a variable for it. And we can pull and push its data just like you can with our other structures. UBOs get passed into shaders uh, just as uniforms, which is something we're going to see later anyway. So let's just wind up UBOs here. Let's look at textures. We'll start off just by making one. Uh, if you look down the bottom, you can see again, we've got a whole range of possible arguments, including initial contents, um, which we're going to actually use. So we're going to put data in there as well. Uh, but we can specify anything from the dimensions of the base image to whether it have mipmaps, how many mipmap layers, whether you want to generate those mipmaps, whether it's a cube texture, rectangle, multi-sample, all that kind of stuff. One important thing to note is that in Keppel, all textures are immutable storage by default. If the GPU that you're on doesn't support immutable textures, um, Keppel will use mutable storage, but it will only present an API that can be used in a safe way. So it essentially treats them as immutable textures anyway. Okay, so let's make this texture. As you can see, we've got a texture object back. In fact, I'm just going to stick it in a variable straight away. Let's do text. Take that. Okay, so there's our texture. Now a texture is a structure containing a bunch of images. Um, so we need to be able to get at those images and we do this with text ref. So we give it our texture and then we can specify which mipmap layer, mipmap level, layer or cube face we're interested in. By default, they're all zero. And as soon as we've only um, given enough data for one image, that's all we're gonna have right now. So let's just hit return. So you can see that text ref, rather than returning some kind of image type has returned another GPU array. Um, but the only difference is this time it's backed by a texture. You can see with GPU arrays that are backed by textures, 
the element type is actually the image format um, of the data on the GPU. You can also pull and push data from these GPU arrays just like you could with the buffer backed GPU arrays. The last very common thing that we're going to want to be able to do with our textures is sample them. So let's clear this screen, bring back our texture. So if we want to create a sampler for this, all we have to do is sample a texture. And here is our sampler for our one dimensional texture. Now on all GPUs that support it, this will be backed by a sampler object on um, GPUs that don't. This will hold the sampling parameters and apply them to the texture and remove them from the texture as needed. It's non ideal, uh, but if you're working on that kind of GPU, you just got to be careful not to change the state too much. Uh, we're going to have some primitives added to Keppel in time that are going to cache render state, and so we're going to be able to minimize some of this, but still, it, as with older GPUs, it's something you're just going to have to be a bit more mindful of. Let's uh, create a variable to stick our sampler in. Okay, so if we want to get access to the sampler parameters, let's say um, the minify filter of the sampler. We just write this, and you can see it's linear. Of course, we can just set this with setf. So we could say, I don't know, nearest bitmap nearest. So it's just the kind of usual settings that you can apply to these things. The uh, best way to get um, information on this is just to go and look at the documentation for samplers. Um, so here is documentation for sample itself. And we can jump to the sampler type, which has the full rundown of all the things we actually support from LOD to filtering, etc, etc. Now every time you call sample, you're getting a, a new Keppel sample object. So you may worry that underneath the hood, we're just spitting out sample objects everywhere. Uh, luckily, this isn't the case. We um, take a little bit of effort to at least deduplicate some of these. But what is there right now is very rudimentary. Um, I've got a ticket for it, so I will be improving that very soon. Next thing to look at would be uh, vertex array objects. And these come under a very different name in um, Kevin. The vertex array object um, describes the location and the stride and all those kind of things of the data that we're going to stream out of one of our buffer objects. Cena's, this is all about streaming. The uh, name of the type is a buffer stream. So we can say make buffer stream. And we can, what we do here is we pass in some GPU arrays we want to stream data from. We can also optionally pass in uh, an index array. And when we do that and render using this stream, it will be using indexed rendering. Essentially, a buffer stream is just a vertex array object with a length and a little bit more metadata. So let's finish off making this one. We just pass in a GPU array, hit return, and here we are, we have a buffer stream um, of length 10. We're going to see uh, GPU streams again very soon because the way we render inside Keppel is to map one of these streams over a GPU pipeline. Rather than getting ahead of myself, I think we'll stop now and take a look at viewports. One thing that is unusual in Keppel compared to standard OpenGL is that viewports are explicit objects. So we're able to do the following. We can say make viewport. We're able to specify the resolution and origin. For now, I'm just going to leave these as the defaults. Uh, We've then got this first class viewport object. So I'm just going to stick this in a variable. And now what we can do with it is we can use the with viewport macro. And what this means is that any rendering that takes place inside this scope is going to be using this viewport unless another with viewport scope has been created. It can seem like a small detail, but being able to interact with viewports this way turns out to be fairly handy. And finally, let's look at FBOs. So like a number of the other uh, functions for creating these primitives, make FBO can take a number of arguments. In the simplest case, we just enumerate which attachments we want to have created. And so let's say, for example, I want uh, an attachment in slot zero and slot one, and also a depth attachment. Now what Keppel is gonna do is it's going to look at the current viewport, take that size, um, create textures um, of the size of that viewport with formats that are kind of sensible defaults for rendering into. Then it is going to attach those to the FBO in our specified attachments. So you can see here what we have 
is an FBO with two color attachments and one depth attachment. Let's make a quick variable to stick this in. Okay, so the next thing we need to look at is the attachments themselves. So just like how uh, a texture is a structure that contains a number of texture by GPU arrays, and we uh, get them with the textref function, uh, we also have a function for getting hold of the attachments. And that is attachment, which takes an FBO, and then um, an index into this FBO. So the color attachments are indexed um, by number. So the first color attachment is zero, the next second is one, etc. Let's just do that now. You can also specify that you want the depth attachment um, by using the D keyword. As you can see, um, all of these have been given kind of sensible defaults, the size taken from the default viewport, the um, RGB 8 or the depth component 24 are just what the GLSL uh, spec recommended. So we go with that. Of course, even though the way we used make FBO was pretty automatic, you can specify any single one of these or all of these down to the minutia. So you can really pick details. You can say, I want to use this pre-existing um, GPU array. I want to create a new texture and take the GPU array from that, but I want the, um, to create that texture with all of these parameters, say element type, dimensions, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you have a lot of control over this. Of course, when we render into these FBOs, we will need to be able to control um, blending. Uh, so what we can use is the function called blending params. This takes an FBO and optionally um, an index to a particular attachment. Now let's just start with the FBO. We, when we hit return here, we can see that we get the, we have default blending parameters set up. This works fine for all GL versions we care about, um, but on some of the more recent versions, we're able to set per attachment uh, blending parameters. So let's go and look at the blending parameters for a given attachment, say the second color attachment. We can see that currently no attachment specific blending is specified. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this Oops. And we're going to say make blending params. Now, if you look down the bottom, the signature there, you can see how you can specify um, the mode, alpha, source RGB, all that kind of stuff. And you can do it, you can set as many or as few as you like. In this case, I'm just going to accept the defaults. And now for that single attachment, it also has blending parameters. And this can be set independently of the FBOs. If you're on a GPU that doesn't support this, of course, Kepler will gracefully fall back and just use the FBO blending. There are some details to this kind of stuff, um, but I'm gonna leave that to the documentation so I don't make this video too long. The last thing we really need to know about FBO is how to render into them. Um, the most common way of doing this is with FBO bound and then specify the FBO. Uh, you can also specify a number of things like what the target is and a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to go into now uh, because it's covered well in the documentation. Of course, just go on any exported symbol and you will find extensive documentation for that given thing. What happens now is that if any rendering is done inside the scope of with FBO bound, the outputs from the fragment shader are going to be written into the attachments. And because Common Lisp supports multiple return values, if your fragment shader returns multiple values, each of those values will be mapped into another color attachment. And this is great. So it means you can just return three things and they will be written into the first three color attachments of the bound FBO. We're gonna see a little more of this in a second. I'm actually just going to um, rejig things a little and then we're gonna look at pipelines. Okay, so now we're gonna look at shaders and programs and this is going to be the last bit and uh, seeing as we've just kind of sat through a lot of kind of code and rebel examples i've decided may as well put on something distracting in the background uh, while we do this so let's just see if this is going to do anything okay yep we'll leave that guy there and let's go and bring up the code that we're going to be looking at excellent and let's kick this off okay so in OpenGL, we're used to uploading shaders as kind of strings and then um, having them composed together into a program. Kepler abstracts this um, fairly heavily. 
so the first thing is that instead of writing um, GLSL, for the most part, you're going to be writing the shaders in Lisp. Uh, so what you can see here is a GPU function, and you write it uh, very similar to how you would in uh, regular Lisp, and then this gets cross-compiled using um, our compiler varia into GLSL code. And then, uh, once you have some GPU functions, you want to use the stages, uh, you create a pipeline out of them using this def g pipe um, operator. This is for creating named pipelines. In future, you will also be able to create anonymous pipelines, like the equivalent of lambdas uh, on the GPU. Once you have one of these pipelines, you're able to map one of those buffer streams over it, and that is how we do rendering. We kind of touched them slightly in some of the other examples, but I just didn't explain what I was doing. Um, you can specify um, what stages these uh, GPU functions are going to be used for. So let's say vertex here and fragment here. Technically, you could put geometry in tessellation, but I have not tested that stuff, and I don't really expect it to work yet. Uh, so mileage may vary. In fact, it's, your mileage is probably zero. Um, but if you're only specifying two, then it's got to be vertex and fragment, so in which case these guys become optional. You can also create GPU functions which aren't used as stages, and then you can just call them from other GPU functions, and they get all brought into the same shader, uh, into the same pipeline, rather, um, when you do that. So what defining a pipeline does is it defines a, a, a Lisp function, and the first time that function is called, it's going to upload everything. Uh, it's going to compile the code, um, create the GLSL strings, uh, upload them to the GPU, set up a program, grab the program ID, look at all the uniform positions, record those, and a bunch of other bookkeeping stuff, uh, which allows you to um, pass things like uniforms just as regular arguments. Your stream of data um, gets basically applied. Think of the um, function apply from Lisp. Um, it's going to apply to this function, and then the uh, uniforms are just going to be passed. So here is how we do rendering. What we do is we um, say map g, and we map a pipe a sorry a buffer stream in this case full screen quad. If we go to our REPL actually and have a look at that, you can see that that is a buffer stream of length six. Um, that yeah, that'll be our full screen quad. You can see it's indexed for some reason. Um, we then map that stream over this pipeline, and we also pass up these uniforms. So these are the positions of the gravity wells that are throwing all those particles around right now. And these are the samplers uh, for the textures that are holding the positions and velocities of all those particles. And that's basically it. Um, we see our, our um, with FBO bound that we were talking about just a minute ago. And so we can tell that all of this that's going on inside here is getting written into um, this FBO that's specified. And blending is turned off because we're using it for updating uh, velocities in this case. And that's pretty much it. I don't think I've left anything out. We've gone through uh, from context creation to kind of basic memory, um, buffer objects, VAOs, UBOs, textures, samplers. Um, we've looked at frame buffer objects and attachments and how you can attach blending parameters to those. Uh, we've looked at the fact that viewports are explicit and that we've seen how to define pipelines. And before this uh, thing on the right just turns into a big pile of ugly noise, I'm going to call this video to a close, and thank you very much for watching. Ciao!